who is the greatest? Muhammad Ali said that I am the greatest, right? Very boastful, very proud. Like, I'm the best boxer. I'm the best boxer there's ever been, the best boxer there ever will be. I am the greatest. Our culture is fascinated with who is the greatest. It even became much more clear to me uh, this last week as I I was preparing for the sermon. Uh, When I look at the internet or as I watch TV, our, our culture is fascinated with the greatest, with greatness. And so this last week, um, it was, uh, who's the best basketball player? Who's the greatest basketball player of all time? Is it LeBron or is it Michael Jordan? Who is the greatest? I hear, uh, Larry, yeah, the, the hick from French Lick, right? I mean, it's Larry Bird, obviously. Our culture, I mean, and these two guys are arguing back and forth about who, who's the greatest. If I were to ask, uh, you know, who the greatest uh, baseball player or football player or who the greatest president is or who the greatest uh, whatever is, like we would, we would all have these different answers and we'd all kind of get in these little arguments. And, oh, he's the greatest because of this, this, and this, and this. We're fascinated by, by the, being the greatest or, or greatness. I, I wonder what you would say this morning. Like if I were to ask you, who's the greatest Christian? Now you can't say Jesus. All right. Who, everybody since Jesus, after Jesus, in your own minds, think like, who would that be? Okay, now I have a question for you. Why? What makes them great? What does it take to be a great Christian? Chances are we might all have different standards of. of what it takes to be great, (laughs) what it takes to be a a really good Jesus follower. Uh, Some of our traditions that maybe we we grew up in or that we know of, it's if you want to be great, you've got to follow all of the rules. Like don't sin or or follow all of the rules of the church. And if, if you can just follow all of the rules, you'll be a good Christian. You'll be a great Christian. Here's the problem, though. None of us are perfect. We all fall short of those rules. We, we break those rules. Um, so does that mean that we can't be great? Uh, one of the, the questions that is asked me when I talk to a new believer is this. Well, okay, so now what? Now, now what do I do? What do I have to do to be, to be a Jesus follower? What do I have to do maybe implicitly, to be great? How do I do this Christianity thing? Do I just have to read my Bible? Well, what happens if I miss a day? Or do I just have to pray every day? Or what does this, this following Jesus thing look like? What do I have to do? In many ways, as we look at uh, this, this man who comes to Jesus with a question, he looks at, the, the, at what he has to do to be great. What does he have to do to be a good God follower, a good Jew? And I think Jesus begins to flip the switch a little bit and make it from not what do you have to do, but what do you have to be. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark. Mark chapter 12. I, would just, I just want to, as, as we turn, I want to give a little background to this story. And we see this happening throughout Jesus' ministry, where people are coming to Jesus with questions. Now, some of the questions are, uh, Jesus, what do you think about this hot topic of the day? So in other words, uh, in, in our religious circles, like this is a question we've really been debating recently. What do you think, Jesus? What are your thoughts on this controversial topic of faith? Give us your answer. We want to know what you think. There are some times that people come to Jesus with questions, and they want to trip him up. They want to catch him. They want to be able to say, hey, look at this guy. He's a heretic. Look at this guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, We we want to trip him up. We want to get him in trouble. And we see other people coming to Jesus with some very authentic questions. 
about what it means to truly live a life of faith. Or to put it another way, what it truly means to be great. To really be an authentic follower of God. And I think it's this last story that this man comes with. So Mark chapter 12, and we'll be starting in verse 28. If you don't have your Bibles this morning, it's also on the screen. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So in other words, they're, these, they're debating these hot topics of the day. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, asked him, of all of the commandments, which is the most important? Now, just to kind of understand this man and his question a little bit. Uh, this, uh, this says he, he was a teacher of the law. Some passages talk about uh, him being a scribe. Now, there was no printing press in that day to just kind of pump out millions of, of Bibles of the King James or Zondervan or whatever. Like, every Bible had to be painstakingly hand-copied. And so this scribe, his, his job, his duty was to copy word for word, syllable for syllable, dot for dot, like everything from one page. Uh, onto one piece of paper. So he just spent his entire day just copying the Word of God, day in, day out. I don't know if you've ever spent that much time doing just like one activity, but, but what happens is you begin to like sleep, eat, like when you close your eyes, you, like you still can't like get that image uh, out of your mind. Hey, if you've ever, like I for my own, like, sometimes I play video games a little bit too long when I was a kid, and you close your eyes, and, like, I see, like, the little Tetris blocks, like, coming down. And, like, this man had his life revolved around Scripture. He knew it forward and backwards. All 613 commandments he knew. He lived the Word of God. And he comes to Jesus authentically and says, which of these 613 commandments is the greatest? What do I have to do to follow God well? What does it take? And Jesus says this, starting in verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. He starts there. Now, Jesus isn't just like pulling this out of nowhere. Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament. In fact, he's not just quoting any passage from the Old Testament. He's quoting a, a passage called the Shema. It is the most important passage for, uh, of, of Jewish faith. Every morning they would wake up, a faithful Jew would wake up and they would recite the Shema. Every uh, Evening, when they would go to bed, they would recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord our God. And they would just recite the passage. It, it, it shaped their lives. It transformed their lives. The Shema did. In fact, when I was in Hebrew, we had to memorize uh, the Shema. It took me all night, day after day, like I just trying to... And, and I remember, like, the, the first part, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ehad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It shaped their faith. It shaped them as individuals. There isn't a God of the New Testament and a God of the Old Testament. There's not a, a God of wrath and a God of love. No, God is one. John, an early follower of Jesus, who is writing some of the passages in the New Testament, says this about God. Like, God is at his very character, at his very core, love. God is love. There's no angry God and loving God. No, no, no. God is love. He is one God. 
And it is this one God who works to bring salvation for Israel. Because that's when Moses, the, the person who writes the Shema down, is writing. He has just saved them out of Israel. And so God's love is not just like, oh, like this, this affection that we have. Oh, I love them, and it just kind of gives me the goosebumps. No, the love that is, is used here, and, and the Greek word is, is the word agape. And it is a love that always acts out. It is, a, it is a, a love that is sacrificial. A love that always considers someone else first. It's not mindful of what I can get out of it. That is the love of God. It is this love of God that, that works to bring salvation for Israel, to bring them out of slavery in Egypt. God has worked to bring salvation. We see this in the New Testament that in Jesus, God has once again worked to bring salvation. What does John say in, in 3.16? For God so agape, for God so loved the world that he just stayed, in, oh, I love them. No, no, no. His love acts out in sending his son. Love works. Love acts And so Jesus begins by quoting the Shema in the same way that God has loved you. With an unfailing, unfathomable love. So also love the Lord your God. What does it say? With all of your heart. The heart is the place of like desire in terms of like the future. These are my aspirations. These are my dreams. Love the Lord with all of your dreaming about the future. Love the Lord with all of your longing. Students, when you thought about what college you were going to go to or, or what job you were going to have, was it done with the motivation that I want to love God with my longings? As you look at what you want for the future, how you save for retirement, what job you have, what you do in retirement, is it done with a desire to love God at its core? Love God with all of your desires, with all of your longings, with all of your heart dreams. Why? Because God has first loved you. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. What Jesus is talking about here is this. The idea that, that you are to love God to the point of not sinning. Love the Lord your God so much that you don't want to sin. That you don't sin. That you would really only give your life to not sin. To keep yourself pure. To keep yourself holy and blameless and set apart. That's what it looks like to love God. I would almost rather die than commit sin. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. With all of your dreams. With all of your soul. Your desire to be pure. With all of your mind. I see, I think we have this idea at times in our culture that, that when we become Christians, we have to shut off our minds. It's all about faith, and I don't have to think. No, no, no. Jesus is encouraging to love God with your minds. He gave us the ability to think in your profession. Are you thinking and using your mind for God's glory and out of God's love? We have this idea that, oh, like science and faith are contradictory. No, 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 no. God has given us our minds. Not so we can shut them off when we become Christians, so that we can use them to glorify and to love God even more. Love the Lord your God with all of your strength, with all of your will, with all that you are, with everything you possess, steadfastly desire to love God. To be great is to love greatly. To love God with all that you are. You want to be great, start with loving God. Ground your love in God. 
Because a, a God-shaped love will shape everything else in your life. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and all of your strength. But Jesus does something that no one had ever done before next. Now, if you're the scribe and, and he's quoting this, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is good. I know this part, right? I've memorized this part when I was a kid. But then Jesus does something revolutionary. He does something that no one had done before, and he, he says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. The second is this. Now, I'd be like, no, Jesus, I just asked for one. And, and Jesus like, hold on, I'm on a roll. Like, let me, let me finish, right? The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus brings these two things, these two ideas together. Love of God and love of neighbor. You see, our love of neighbor must find its grounding in our love of God. We love God, and it shapes how we love our neighbor. Because otherwise, our love of our neighbor can turn into this affection, meaningless nothing. You're like, oh yeah, I love them. Well, well how are you acting out God's love for them? How are you loving them? Well, from a distance. No, 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 that's not how God loves, though. You see, our love of God finds its shape in how we love our neighbor. Each and every day of our lives. Love your neighbor. Like, that's a brilliant idea until it has to be your neighbor, right? I remember when, I, when we had an apartment in Bremen, uh, we had this up. My wife is smiling. She knows what I'm going to say without even me having to tell her first. Like, we had this neighbor above us. I don't know what they had in their room that they would roll across the floor constantly. At all hours of the night, I'm like, are you, do you, are you bowling up there? Like, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. What do you have up there? Are you rolling a barrel across the floor? If you, I don't know if you've ever lived in an apartment with someone above you or if you've had a neighbor that was difficult to love. Like loving your neighbor is a great idea until you have to love your neighbor. The one that annoys you. The one that, that, that doesn't mow their lawn or the one that mows their lawn at like 6 a.m. and when you're trying to sleep. The one that throws the wild parties. I mean, finally, it was like 3 o'clock in one, mor one morning. And I woke up, and we, we had both woke up, and, and we, I think we had our daughter Isabella by then. And I just like, enough is enough. And it was the only time I actually, I, I mean, went up there. I was like, I, this, has, this has got to stop. And I, I said, could you just, and I, I, as lovingly as possible, with the love of Jesus, as much as possible, I said, could you, could you please keep it down? We're like trying to sleep. And they had a billiard table. I'm like, it's on the third floor. How did you even get that thing up here? See, the love of neighbor is easy until it's your neighbor, the one that annoys you, the one that ticks you off. Do you have a neighbor like that? And none of you are neighbors, raise your hand. I don't want to cause any church conflicts. And, and Jesus clarifies, as yourself. How many of you find reasons to love yourself? How many of you do like the Stuart Smaller, like I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. No, like you don't have to look for reasons to love yourself. You just naturally do it, a lot of us, most of us. And, and, and you're like, I'm a, I'm a nice guy, I'm a loving guy, like, uh, I love me. Now, now take all of that and, and transfer it to your neighbor. How many of you love your neighbor that way? 
or do you look for reasons to love your neighbor first? Do you forgive your neighbor when they annoy you as you would like to be forgiven? Do you show mercy and grace and kindness? Not because they're naturally a nice person. It's easy to love naturally nice people. It's harder to love those people who are difficult to love. Do you love them as yourself? I, I used to be a, a, a substitute teacher in high school. This was, I think, before I got married. And... Um, Listen, sometimes, uh, I love you high school students, sometimes, like, you just drive me crazy. Now, not none of you. You guys are all perfectly well-behaved. Not you. Not, yeah. Um, I just, I just, I love you. At, no. Like, sometimes students can just really get under your skin and just do things, and, and you're just like, why? why? Why did you do that? What, what are you thinking? And like day after day, like I, I show a lot of love and respect to teachers to do that day after day after day because I couldn't do it. And you can easily have this negative attitude and, and it's easy to love the smart students like we have, the ones that are well behaved like we have. It's harder to love the students that you're just like, why? And, and God really convicted me one day. He said, you know what? Begin to see them as I see them. So as I began to walk down the halls, every student, I'd look into their eyes and say this. You are a beloved child of God whom Jesus died for. Talk about changing the way that you think and the way that you act even to those kids that are difficult at times to love. That idea that God loves them as much as he loves me. It changes your perspective. It changes how you act towards them. How many of you have thought about your neighbor? This is someone that God loves, that God died for, and that God is calling me to love them, to show kindness towards them to forgive them, even if they never reciprocate that back. See, to be great is to love greatly, to love God, and to love your neighbor, because those two things are tied together. We can't say, oh, I love God, but I hate my neighbor. No, no, no. Our love of God gives shape to how we love our neighbor. To be great is to love greatly. To be great is to love God greatly. To be great is to love our neighbor greatly. It's always easier said than done. I want to encourage you this morning to put some hands on this. And what I mean by this is let's, let, I, I don't want to give you some like, now, now, go be loving thing. I want to give shape to how you love. So if for those of you who like some practical hands-on things to do, like this part is for you, right? Every morning when you wake up, I want you to recite these commandments. Or what, uh, I like what Scott McKnight said, this Jesus creed. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And love my neighbor as myself. Every morning, when your feet hit the floor, recite that. Every morning when God brings it to your mind, recite it. Say it. Because sometimes we need those prompts. We need those reminders when we're having rough days. When that neighbor's doing something that annoys us. Scott McKnight, who is a professor of New Testament... In Chicago, he gave this challenge to his students one day. He said, I've been doing this, and I, I encourage you to do this as well. And, and one of his students was named Tim. 
And, and Tim took up this challenge for himself. He said, I'm, I'm going to commit myself to doing this. I'm going to commit myself to when I wake up in the morning to reciting this Jesus creed, this greatest commandment. And one day he goes to Scott, Professor McKnight, and he said, I never realized before how many homeless people were on my route to school. That before I had walked right by. He said, I, I never noticed them before. But since I've been praying this prayer, I've seen them. What happens is that, that throughout the rest of college, Tim begins to like work with the homeless, and he gets to graduation, and, and he has a choice. He says, I can go on to get my Ph.D. And, and to become a professor, or I also have this opportunity to work with the homeless here in Chicago. What should I do? His ultimate choice was to work with the homeless in Chicago. Because he felt that was the way that God was calling him to extraordinary love. Works with the homeless in Chicago, now does so on a national uh, basis with a group called Sojourners. What began as a simple reciting, reciting the Jesus Creed, changed the course of his life. I wonder as well if you just took the opportunity each and every morning to recite that creed. Today, God, I want to love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. And I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. And, and at times it might say, God, like, give me the strength to do that. How would it change you? And the second thing is this, meditate on it. Meditate on the Jesus Creed. Meditate on this greatest commandment. Because what happens is it will give shape to how you love. It will give shape to the ways in which you show love to God and the ways that you show love to your neighbor. It will mean that, that God will begin to work in your heart and in your mind not just so that you act loving, but that you are loving. Not just so that you do good, but that you, you are good. You are loving at your very core. We talk about greatness, what it means to be great. Jesus' answer is love, is agape, a self-sacrificing love to God and others. When we talk about a response this morning, I want you to think about who is that person in your life that is difficult to love. It doesn't have to be a physical neighbor. Maybe it's a neighbor in the next cubicle over at work. Maybe it's, it's somebody that has the, the locker right next to you. Right now, who would you say, God, it is difficult for me to love this person? but I want to commit myself to loving them and to seeing them as you see them. So as a response this morning, if, if God is bringing someone to your mind like that, I invite you to simply come write that name up on a piece of paper and slip it in the prayer wall. As an act of commitment, God, I, I want to, to be great by loving them greatly and to see them how you see them. Second way, and it's a little different than the question up there, is how is God calling you to love him? As you go through your dreams and your aspirations, as you go through your life and begin to look at the, the ways that you're living, or would you say, like, I'm committing sin, how are you loving God with your soul? How are you using your mind to glorify God? Are you loving him with all? Is there any area of your life where you say, this is an area of my life where I'm not loving God, I'm not honoring God? And maybe to write that 
down as well. I invite you this morning to be great by loving greatly. And allow God speak to you about those areas of your life that need to be shaped by his love. As the worship team comes forward, as the prayer team comes forward for prayer. Maybe there's some area in your life that is, you just need prayer for in general. You would say, Matt, I'm going through a hard time in, in this area and, and uh, I just need prayer. Our prayer team is up here for you. Whether it be in response to this sermon or in response to just some need in your life, I, I welcome you. I invite you up to either have someone pray for you or to put a prayer request in the prayer wall. I invite you right now to say, as an act of prayer, to say, God, open the eyes of my heart that I might see you be, and understand your love, be shaped by that love. And open my, the eyes of my heart to see how I might be loving to my neighbor. Will you stand as we respond?